Five, four, three, two, one. And now, coming to you from a subspace channel deep inside your We are tired of being called after the hair of a goat. Have you ever seen Planet TV? Lucian? 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 Okay, okay. I've waited long enough, and now the time has come. Delta Papa Tango, Victor. Have you ever seen Planet TV? Planet TV? Planet TV? Tango, Victor. Love it. Love it. Love it. Delta Papa Tango, Victor. Uh, fantastic video cast. Uh, I'm subscribed, and I love it. Welcome to the Planet TV Show. I'm Lucian, and we're on the net. Yes, we are. Today's Friday, August 22nd. A little break in the storm. Decided I'd take advantage of it. Depending on what happens, I may not be able to post it for a few days. But <clears throat> anyway, I'm here. <sighs> let's see. Let's find out. There you go. Shh. Let's find out what the spin for the day is. Wow, she's naked. Oh, yeah. Always happens to me. She's spinning uh, counterclockwise. Wow, what do you know? Counterclockwise. That means the uh, left side, right. Uh, never mind. <coughs> you know what it means. Ah, uh, well, let's get right to it, shall we? Uh, first story. Turns out that the Bigfoot was a fake. Yeah, I know. Aww. Uh, you know, I'm. I'm like Agent Mulder. I want to believe. <laughs> I just can't find anything to believe in. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. Wonder what that was. Something fell. Anyway, we uh, we all kind of figured it probably was a fake, but it turns out it was. It was one of those costumes that you could get right off of eBay. Who knew, right? Actually, all of us probably knew. And this is a very interesting story. American ingenuity. I tell you what, American ingenuity. There's one thing we can still be proud of in America, right? It's our ingenuity. And uh, I'm in the ingenuity business, so this always makes me happy when I see things like this. But it turns out that a group of very inventive Americans have come up with a better process of making biodiesel fuel. Now, they call it the McGuyan process, uh, which is actually a uh, combination of their names, I believe. Uh, yeah, it is. It's McNiff, Guyberg, and Yan are the people who started the company. Uh, and it's a company in the Midwest, uh, and it basically started off as a college uh, project, a chemistry project, uh, but what they've managed to do is uh, make biodiesel in seconds as opposed to the length of time it normally takes, and it creates a product that costs half the price, produces no waste, and can use virtually any animal fat or vegetable oil as feedstock. Um, it process basically works like this. You're looking at a chart. The raw fats and oils of any combination uh, or any type are combined with an alcohol. Uh, this mixture is fed through sulfated zirconia column Okay, which you can see right there in the diagram, which is heated to 300 degrees Celsius. Uh, then they have a proprietary system, which is the easy fatty acid removal, the EFAR system, recycles any unreacted raw material back through the reactor. Excess alcohol is even recycled back through the reactor, which means there's no loss of either of those, and they're not consumed. And pure biodiesel comes out the end. Uh, the advantages of this system are obviously numerous, but there's no waste product. There's no washing or neutralizing of the biodiesel as in the other processes. Uh, it's a 100% conversion of raw materials to biodiesel, which was the revolutionary part of their technology. Uh, any raw fat or oil can be used to make biodiesel. It's very efficient due to the heat recapture uh, in the column, and sulfated zirconium catalyst never needs to be replaced. Uh, it has a very small footprint for the reactor system, uses a very small amount uh, of area and uh, for the amount of biodiesel produced. Uh, and it has essentially no emissions and no waste stream. Uh, and the stream is continuous. Uh, this is truly an amazing process. They're in the process of building a plant that will make uh, 3 million gallons a year, and they believe within a few years they'll be able to up it to about 30 million gallons a year. And as soon as they get it working, they're going to license the technology. Very cool. American ingenuity, right? Uh, here's some more ingenuity. It turns out that scientists have been able to create blood 
from stem cells. Now, don't freak out yet or anything. They've used embryonic stem cells to generate uh, blood, uh, which is a feat that could eventually lead to endless supplies of O-negative blood, which is a universal uh, and also very rare blood that doctors uh, prize because it can be uh, used in virtually any uh, patient. Uh, Robert Lanza, the chief science officer at the Advanced Cell Technology, says that they literally generated whole tubs in the lab from scratch. Uh, now, it was very interesting uh, what they were able to do, and normally uh, you have to be very careful when you're using uh, embryonic stem cells. Uh, one, they started off with a, an established stem cell line, and they took a very small amount, and then they multiplied them until there was a billion or so cells. Uh, then they were able to differentiate those cells into blood cells, um, and the interesting thing is, is that you have to be careful with stem cells because uh, sometimes uh, they can, they're, they're a little unpredictable. They can introduce genetic mutations into um, the cell that you're trying to get. But because blood cells don't have any DNA, uh, this is potentially much less of a threat to this particular process. Uh, and in fact, uh, because blood cells have no DNA. Uh, this is a very good candidate for taking adult uh, cells and de-differentiating them back into embryonic stem cells. Now normally that process is very susceptible to producing cancerous cells because when you de-differentiate it causes a, rev a reverse genetic mutation sort of uh, as opposed to the other direction uh, and it almost always turns cancerous. However, again, since blood cells don't have any DNA, uh, that would not affect them. Uh, and of course, since blood cells don't have DNA, they don't reproduce, they're actually used and when they reach their life cycle, they're excreted, uh, you know, filtered out and excreted from the body. So there's never any potential for long-term damage uh, or uh, long-term uh, effects from any of the mutations or any problems that may come. Now this is preliminary, even the Red Cross is excited, but but a little bit hesitant to, to get too excited because it's preliminary. This has not been tested in animals yet, but if this works, this is potentially amazing news. We'll be able to produce blood in buckets uh, of any type that we want, uh, including O negative, and uh, that's pretty radical and pretty amazing news. And here's some more amazing news. You know what a CAPTCHA is, right? Of course you do. A CAPTCHA is a completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. You've probably seen them before. They're the little things that you have to, to fill out sometimes with comments or uh, checking on the, definitely for the who is in most places. Um, but you have to uh, identify some scrambled letters and punch them in. That's something that humans are very good at. It's something that computers are not very good at. And there's that's a problem uh, because we're in the process right now of digitizing uh, large uh, volumes of manuscripts uh, of actual written documents that um, are, could potentially be lost to time as many of our documents have before, uh, written works, books, whatever. Uh, but the problem is with computer automated scanning, uh, it's not very accurate and no matter how good we get, we can't get above, you know, around 80% or so accuracy. Now there are human uh, systems. There are companies that uh, offer uh, transcription services that can get to 99.1% accuracy, but they, uh, it's interesting how they do it. They'll have two separate transcriptions and then they'll be read again by another person. Uh, and that gives them the ability to be 99.1% accurate. But some more ingenious and very creative people have figured out that it is possible to use CAPTCHAs and the amount of human processing, and they estimate that a uh, hundred million CAPTCHAs are solved daily by humans on the computer, which is an incredible amount of untapped computer processing power. And um, researchers at Carnegie Mellon uh, have produced uh, a system which takes unknown words, and they tried it on a um, random sampling of 250 New York Times articles, and you can basically imagine that the problem with uh, old texts are that um, they may be damaged or they may be creased uh, and it would make it very difficult for computers to completely identify it. And what they were able to do with a random sampling of 250 New York Times articles dating back, uh, uh, let's see, 100 years, I believe, uh, they were able to 
identify words that the computer missed, and then using a CAPTCHA system called the reCAPTCHA system, which is about in 40,000 sites around the world right now, uh, people, when they had to use the CAPTCHA, would be shown an actual uh, word from one of the documents that were being scanned. And they had the system set up so that every it would take more than just one person's uh, transcription um, of it before it became uh, recognized. But with the reCAPTCHA system and the completely automated computer uh, uh, um, analysis of the first manuscript, they were able to equal a 99.1% accuracy, uh, which is the same as the human system. It was very cool. Uh, it's a use for human processing that we don't really take it, uh, you know, we take it for granted. We don't really think about it, but computers can't solve something like this uh, nearly as well as humans. Uh, in fact, uh, although they're they, they are catching up to us, um, there are other forms of CAPTCHA besides that. My favorite is the uh, kitten CAPTCHA. Have you seen this one? Uh, you see, that's just awesome, isn't it? Looking at Zoom in. You have to find three cats. Yeah, very cool, huh? Yeah, pick out the three kittens, and uh, you solve the CAPTCHA. But anyway, that's something that computers are very bad at, humans are very good at. And because we do this 100 million times a day, uh, the reCAPTCHA system has figured that uh, they could uh, use it to help solve uh, some of the problems with scanning old documents. Very cool, right? Ingenious. One more ingenious story. If you ever have to pack and go someplace, you need to visit this site. This is called the Universal Packing List. Now, this guy has spent years developing this computer program, and it is able to literally tell you what to take no matter where you're going for how long, whether you're packing on a backpack and hiking or whether you're traveling by suitcase. It doesn't matter. Uh, it is an amazing list. Uh, There's actually a story behind it. It came uh, uh, from the news groups, which is where he originally uh, had posted his idea to do this, and it has since been developed with years and years of input from actual users of the Universal Packing List. So if you're going on vacation, you need to pack. I'll have a link to where you can get to the Universal Packing List and uh, maybe save yourself some packing trouble. Don't pack too much. Don't pack too little. Good list. So I've actually used it. It's very cool. And hey, this was very interesting. This past Sunday was the 100th anniversary of the very first animation. Take a look. I have it. It's right here. 100 years ago today, the first animated film of all time was released to the general public. Uh, Phantasmagory was the name of it. It was created over the course of four months by French caricature artist Emile Cole who became known as the father of the animated cartoon, uh, even before Disney. Uh, the short is made up of over 700 drawings, each of which was double exposed, leading to a running time of almost two minutes. Uh, it's, we've got about a running time of one minute and 17 seconds here. Uh, the title is a reference to the Phantasmograph, a mid-19th century magic lantern that was said to project ghostly images floating across the walls. Cole created the drawings on white paper and printed it on a negative to give it a chalkboard drawing feel. And of course there was no sound to it. Okay, it wasn't all that, right? Well, <coughs> it was made by hand. Uh, it was actually individually photographed uh, and strung together to make the very first one. But a professor, what is his name? Yes, Professor Rosko Sirik decided when he heard that the uh, 2008 was going to be the 100th anniversary, he decided to remake Phantasmagory as a tribute to Emil Cole and the 100th anniversary of the very first animated film. Take a look at this.
Very cool. I'll have a link to a couple of articles where you can read all about the uh, symbolism that was in both the first and the second phantasmagory. We've come a long way in a hundred years, haven't we? Yeah, of course we have. In matter of fact, take a look at just how far we have come in computer animation in a hundred years. Wow, <laughs> that would so be me. What a cool coffee machine, too, huh? Oh, did you see it at the end? It went, was diving down again. <coughs> you have to whack it with a wrench. Remember that for all you people who want to go traveling through space. 
That's probably what it's going to be like. Hey, guess what? Yeah, you know what that means. I'll see you next time for the next show. In the meantime, have yourself a good whatever. And do me a favor. Uh, iTunes has introduced the video podcast section again. So uh, please visit my site and go to the iTunes link and leave me a nice review and subscribe through iTunes and all that sort of stuff, right? Some of the monkeys think they've got it all figured out. Some of the monkeys read Nietzsche. The monkeys argue about Nietzsche without ever giving any consideration to the fact that Nietzsche was just another monkey. The monkeys make plans. The monkeys fall in love. The monkeys have sex, and then they make more monkeys. The monkeys make music, and then the monkeys dance. Dance, monkeys, dance! <laughs>